Hello and welcome to today's live webinar, Good Documentation Practices. My name is Afsane Motamed Khorasani and I'm the presenter today for this subject. Let me briefly introduce myself. I am a medical affairs uh, expert with a strong background in cancer informatics, clinical trial design and execution, R&D, regulatory writing and submission, project management, strategic planning, and business development. Um, I have around 20 years of industry experience in US, Canada, and different countries. I have served at different capacities from senior research scientist to vice president of medical affairs in different companies such as Merck, Amgen, Baxter, Johnson & Johnson, Covidian, Medtronic, US Pharmacopeia, Mount Sinai Hospital, Princess Margaret Hospital, and Vancouver General. I am a member of Regulatory Affairs Professional Society, American Society for Quality, American Association of Medical Writers, and Project Management Institute. In this webinar, I'm going to um, review this outline that I have listed here. So we go over the scope of what we are going to cover. Um, I have a couple of pages of abbreviations just for your use. You are welcome to review. Um, this is uh, just the abbreviations I have used during this um, webinar today. Then I'm going to describe good documentation practices and to explain why it is important in any regulated environment for manufacturing. Um, I'm going to also provide the minimum requirements for uh, GDP um, and the reason why it can help. Um, also to go over the rules you need to know and follow when dealing with documentation in a regulated environment. Um, U.S. Pharmacopeia General Chapter 1029 also will be discussed at a very high level and I'm going to briefly touch upon rules governing medicinal products in the European Union again at a very high level and uh, I will cover GDP enforcement um, in the um, final part of the presentation with providing some FDA observations and excerpts of FDA uh, warning letters to elaborate some of the contents that we discussed um, before that. And finally, I have a summary at the end and some references for your review in case you want to learn and read more about GDP. Good documentation practices has been discussed in many different locations throughout different documents from different sources. In other words, there is no single document available that explains in its uh, entirety uh, what it is and how it's helpful. So I have listed here some of these sections of different regulatory bodies around the world um, that are discussing GDP in one way or another. Um, U.S. Pharmacopeia is um, actually the t Title 21 of Code of Federal Regulation or CFR. Um, um, I'm not going to really go in depth today to discuss any of these. We simply don't have time. But we have webinars uh, basically going over uh, these sections in more detail. Uh, we are going to touch upon U.S. Pharmacopeia Chapter 1029, Good Documentation Guidelines. And um, I'm also going to briefly uh, discuss some of the definitions that are provided by uh, International Organization for Standardization or ISO for GDP. Uh, some of the um, definitions and uh, rules and regulations of GDP discussed by International Conference on, Har on Harmonization or ICHQ7 uh, also will be discussed today. And uh, briefly at a high level I'm going to review the rules governing medicinal products in the European Union um, and what was updated in 2011. So everything that you see here in orange um, is not going to be detailed um, uh, here in uh, discussion, but uh, we will have other webinars um, to discuss them in detail. Here are the two pages of abbreviations, as I mentioned before, this is for your Future reference only, I'm not going to discuss it now. So a good documentation practice is commonly abbreviated as GDP. 
However, in order to differentiate it from good uh, distribution practices, which is also abbreviated as GDP, it's recommended that you use GDOCP here uh, to be clear. GDP is a term in uh, the industry that describes standards and best practices on how to create, maintain, and archive documents to remain compliant. It is considered to be a part of current good manufacturing practice, or CGMP, and uh, while, not, is, uh, while it's not a law, uh, regulatory bodies inspect against the GDP guidelines. In case uh, where companies are not following the GDP guidelines, they may get comments, uh, observations, 483s, and other type of penalties, depending on the importance of the case. GDP regulations uh, apply to all personnel, including permanent, temporary interns, summer students, and consultants. Basically, whoever somehow is involved with the process of manufacturing or handling the product should know and follow these rules and regulations. Likewise, it applies to all activities related to the manufacturing of the regulated product, including manufacture, testing, packaging, labeling, support, holding, storing, and transportation. So in order to fully understand this GDP, I have used some definitions by ISO. That's why I just wanted to give a brief uh, overview about um, ISO introduction before I go to those um, definitions of the words. So um, ISO started in 1926 under the name of International Federation of National Standardizing Association, but it was dissolved during the Second World War. Fortunately, it was reorganized again in 1946, and this time it was called um, what we know as ISO, International Organization for Standardization. And the mark, as you see here, um, if you see this mark anywhere, it just shows a certain minimum level of quality and standard. So you can buy it with uh, peace of mind. It is basically a voluntary organization with 162 uh, members. Each member is um, a recognized uh, authority on standards and each member represents one country. For example, British uh, Standards uh, Institute or BSI, American National Standard Institute or ANSI, and Canadian Standards Association or CSA are a few of these members in the UK, US, and Canada. Now let's discuss some of the benefits of ISO. Uh, firstly, um, it is an assurance that the product and services have a certain level of safety, reliability, and good quality. Um, when you see the ISO mark irre irrelevant to the country of manufacturer or company or any other factor, as a matter of fact, you can be sure of certain minimum reliability and quality of the product. Secondly, following ISO standards and regulations provide a strategic tool to reduce the cost of manufacturing by minimizing the waste and errors and to increase the productivity. Thirdly, following these standards again ensures the accessibility of a fast and fair global trade and uh, therefore it's a very helpful strategic tool that can assure the customers of a safe, reliable, and a high quality product. Um, ISO 9000-2005 described the fundamentals of quality management systems and defined related terms. Um, it also provides mutual understanding of the terminology uh, used in quality management for suppliers, uh, customers, and regulators. Right now, we have ISO 9000-2015 in, um, in place. So, um, but the clauses that I have used in this presentation are basically taken from the ISO 9000-2005, and that's why I have referenced that ISO um, here. Um, as indicated in ISO, a document is um, information and its supporting medium. Generally, documents tell you to do some activities. 
and explains how to do different things. Um, here is a schematic uh, representation of examples for information. All of these are um, different examples of different types of in information. Formula, master file, protocol manual, drawing, SOPs, master record, standards, procedures, and specifications. Here is the schematic representation of examples for media, electronic, uh, optical, or magnetic disks, uh, thermal paper strips, photographs, and paper. Now let's define a uh, record. Again, based on ISO, a record is a document stating results achieved or providing evidence of activities performed. Generally speaking, records provide evidence of compliance with established requirements and effectiveness of the operation. Records can be used to document traceability and to provide evidence of verification, preventive action, and correction action, corrective action. Generally, records uh, do not need to be under revision control, and uh, they signify something that was done when some activities have been performed. Here are some examples of different type of records. Um, you have batch records, validation records, batch release records, instrumentation calibration record, batch processing record, and batch packaging record. And uh, finally, let's define documentation. Again, based on ISO definition, a set of documents is frequently called documentation. So specifications and records are two examples of documentation. The main objective of documentation is to introduce sufficient inst instructional details to facilitate a common understanding of the requirements and further to perform sufficient recording of various processes and evaluation of any observation so that uh, the ongoing application of the requirements could be demonstrated. Uh, here are different types of documentation. Um, as you see, instrument printout, notebook, logbook, spreadsheet, data sheet, SOPs, and manual. And here you can see there are different forms of documentation, including paper, thermal paper, electronic disk, lab uh, information management system, or LIMS, electronic lab notebook, or ELN, magnetic disk, optical and computer disk, and photographs. So what is the purpose of GDP? Um, as indicated in ISO 9000-2005, GDP enables communication of intent to disseminate and preserve the organization's experiences in order to share the knowledge. Uh, the main objective of GDP is to use it as a tool for communication of intent, preservation of knowledge, and information transmission to communicate the information to provide evidence of conformity for the provision of evidence that what was planned has been actually done. Uh, a typical example would be a technical specification which can be used as a base for design and development of a new product. So GDP ensures that the documents are legible and identifiable and ensures that there is an adequate record of all activities in place. So uh, these regulations apply to all the steps documents go through from drafting, review, approval, and update which brings about a good level of consistency of action in general. Furthermore, it ensures that uh, identification of the current revision versus the retired version of the documents is a seamless process and prevents the unintended use of obsolete or archived documents. Also, it ensures that there is a process in place to allow for identification of the external documents and controlling their distribution. It also ensures the availability of the current version of the documents at the point of use in order to minimize the possibility of errors and noncompliance.
Finally, it provides evidence that a product was made according to regulatory um, uh, requirements that applies. In short, uh, if I want to define, GDP provides detailed instruction and explanation on what needs to be done, which is the process, how to do it, which is the methodology, why it needs to be done, which is the context, who must do it, which is explaining the responsibilities, and when to do it, which is explaining the frequency. So it's a very comprehensive um, um, tool if you can properly use it. Now let's discuss why GDP is so important in what you do. Um, GDP is expected, first of all, as the basic foundation of a quality system to ensure proper documentation and proper control um, applied throughout the lifetime of the product. It simply increases the chance of product success if GDP regulations are followed. So um, following GDP leads to the accuracy of data and results through maintaining the data integrity and providing correct, complete, current, and consistent information to effectively meet customers or stakeholders' requirements. Also, GDP is essential in regulated environment to ensure the integrity, traceability, control, and retention of the documents. It creates traceability in all aspects uh, and during the lifetime of a regulated product through facilitation of troubleshooting in case something happens in terms of discrepancies or deviations, as well as providing audit trail to be able to address the questions raised during an audit. By regulatory bodies. Um, as FDA puts it, if it is not written down, it didn't happen. But how it is written is equally important. Let's now discuss the attributes of records in general. So in general, when you're dealing with records, you need to complete the records as soon as actions are performed. It is against GDP regulations to fill out the, the forms or documents before actually performing the task, um, simply because it just increases the chance to miss something, a miss, to miss a step or insert something wrong. Uh, once you complete, these records need to be returned as per applicable retention guidance for a certain time. So um, also you need to include appropriate controls to protect the record integrity. And it's very important also to create an adequate uh, document system that is capable of and optimized for um, proper archiving and traceability. So in general, there are eight attributes that records need to have, and I'm going to explain them here one by one. Uh, they need to be truthful when uh, you sign a record. Basically, um, you are uh, testifying that the information is factual and true. Secondly, records uh, should be complete. If you are dealing with a form, all parts of the form should be filled properly. Even if it doesn't apply, you should not leave it blank. Just place not applicable or NA in that space. Um, if there are any parts of the page that is not used, do not leave it blank either. Cross it with a diagonal line to show that this is the unused space, date and initial. This is to prevent somebody else in the future to go back and insert some kind of data or information that was not um, entered by you. The next one is um, the records should be concise. Um, so basically, when you capture, you should only capture the necessary facts and not subjective guesses or your opinion or ideas. Legibility, specifically of numbers and characters, is another attribute that records need to possess. So what is captured in a record needs to be tidy, organized, and properly um, um, placed in the page and easily readable. If there are handwritten parts in the record, this becomes specifically important when you are dealing with some numbers and letters. And I have some selections um, that are mostly uh, causing trouble. 
for example, 0 and 6, U and V, S and number 5, number 1 and number 7, and finally number 3, number 8, and letter B. So you need to be really careful when you are dealing with these, uh, just to make sure somebody else um, can uh, differentiate what you are writing. There should be also a good level of consistency throughout the records in terms of formatting for paragraphs, dates, times, styles, numbering, and bullets. You should always follow the same style. Um, they need to be also accurate. So records should be uh, capturing the information and facts accurately and detailed enough to enable another person in the future to exactly follow what you have written and be able to replicate the experience at a later time. Therefore, all kinds of helpful details that uh, you, you think is going to be helpful um, need to be captured and included. Some things like calculations, the spelling of chemicals, manufacturer's name and address, lot numbers, reference material numbers, serial numbers, and anything like that. The information should be uh, captured in a permanent manner in your record. So if there is a need to fill out some parts of a printed document, a permanent indelible marker uh, should be used in black. Avoid using other colors such as blue or red or any other colors. Blue colors specifically is troublesome because uh, when you are making copies, it does not reflect in copy as clearly as the black color and uh, avoid using pencils because it, they are going to be faded over time and this is against the regulations of GDP. And the last one is that records should be clear and uh, easily interpretable by um, uh, other people. So basically you need to avoid using ambiguous terms and interpretations and be always factual and communicate what you observe. At this time, let me uh, go over some of the general rules and principles of GDP. First thing, uh, let's start by uh, answering the question, how to properly document information. Um, for handwritten documents, use only black indelible ballpoint permanent ink, as I mentioned before. Do not use pencils or non-permanent markers. Make sure all entries are legible and provide adequate space between lines for clarity and legibility. Uh, document each step before moving to the next one. Again, this is important in order to make sure you don't make mistakes or you don't escape any of these um, steps that you're supposed to follow. Also, you are not supposed to use detail marks. Detail marks are uh, the, the signs that means the same as uh, what has been written before. So for example, um, if you mention solution one, 50 milliliters, and solution two, if it's 50 milliliters, you can use ditto marks in regular writing. However, in regulated environment and based on GDP, this is not um, uh, a good idea. So you should avoid using this. You have to repeat basically 50 milliliters again. Do not leave any empty spaces, as I mentioned before, if they do not apply. Instead, just use an A or not applicable. And finally, all documents should be reviewed, approved, signed, and dated by an eligible authorized uh, personnel. Uh, it is important to remember that you cannot review and approve your own documents. Somebody else needs to do it for you. When a document is electronically produced, it should be checked for accuracy and also a signature, um, electronic signature needs to ap be applied to this document. Finally, it's um, a very important point to remember, a signature stamp is not a, a acceptable in GDP environment instead of a handwritten signature. Um, all entries to a regulated document in general must um, be accompanied by a signature or initial which is basically a tracking system to verify the task was done at a certain date by a certain individual. There should be a meaning associated with signature or initial. This meaning uh, should be clearly mentioned in each signature and uh, 
It can be a performer, recorder, or reviewer, or re uh, verifier. But in any case, it has to be clear uh, what is this uh, signature, uh, what's the meaning of the signature. Initials are most of the time acceptable, except otherwise is mentioned. So um, if it's mentioned that you need to have signatures, just use your signatures. Um, each company has its own style and manner of doing things. So always make sure you know what's the style and they recommend and always follow your company style for entering signatures and initials. And finally, it's a good practice to keep a logbook to capture all signatures and initials from all personnel. It doesn't matter if they're full-time, part-time employees, contract, consultant, anybody who is dealing with a product at some point and somehow they need to uh, be captured in this logbook in terms of signature and initial. Um, in general, three different meanings may apply to each signature, as I mentioned before. The first one is when the signature means something was performed by the signature owner. Um, as we discussed previously per uh, GDP, during a process, each step should be documented prior to the next step and then the performer needs to sign for it. However, only the trained personnel or the ones who are under supervised training can sign or initial for uh, performance. The second meaning of signature is when um, it means something was uh, recorded by a signature owner. When the operator who is uh, performing a certain step cannot initial and date due to a restricted area of worker environment, let's say when working in a laminar flu hood, you're wearing um, gloves and you cannot touch anything else. So the recording of the data signing and dating can be done by another personnel who is watching the process being done based on the protocol or SOP, and that's perfectly fine based on GDP rules and regulations. And the third scenario is when the signature means something was verified by the signature owner. Again, we discussed before, per GDP regulations, each step should be verified before continuing to the next step. And of course, you cannot verify your own actions, um, so someone else needs to do it for you. However, only the personnel proficient in the task performed who have witnessed the task was done following the written instruction and documented can uh, verify a task. The other thing you need to consider when copying records is to make sure that uh, the copies are legible. Make sure no errors are introduced in the uh, process of copying also add page numbers in the format of page X of, X of Y to minimize errors in review completion. And finally, you should never eliminate any of the pages in the document since this can be inferred as obscuring the data which is not allowed per GDP. Documents should be regularly viewed and updated. In other words, they should be always current. Based on the regulatory body requirements as applicable to your country and to your product, they should be retained for proper period of time. And uh, the records need to be available for review and audit if you're asking, you are being asked by uh, regulatory agencies. If the documents are being electronically maintained, you need to have a proper electronic document management system that is both validated and properly functioning. You also need to have um, scheduled um, backup of all the e-documents that um, regularly uh, backs up this data on a safe and reliable media. Uh, you need to allocate specific controls to ensure these e-documents can only be modified or approved by authorized personnel. Um, to the access to these e-documents also need to be controlled by password, identification code, or even both. Uh, depending on your system, if it's closed or open system, you need to have different combinations of these security measures. And finally, 
um, the history of all changes and the deletions of all these e-documents, uh, which is considered audit trails, should be preserved and kept in a safe media. How to properly record time. The next thing to discuss is uh, basically there are two ways of capturing times. You can either use meridian or military time formats, which I'm going to explain in a moment. In the meridian time format, there is one to two digits for the hour from one to 12, and you have two digits for the minutes from zero to 59. Then you add AM and PM to differentiate morning and afternoon. So for example, if you have 8.36 AM, that shows a time in the morning, and 5.45 PM shows a time in the afternoon. On the other hand, in military time format, there are two digits for the hour from 0 to 23, and two digits for the minutes from 0 to 59. Uh, as an example, for 8.36, it's a time in the morning and 17.45 is the time in the afternoon. One thing to always consider is to be consistent in terms of the formatting and all the documents you touch. In this company, also you need to follow your company style, whatever they have chosen, you need to always use the same format. And finally, be sensitive to uh, cultural differences in capturing time since we are living in a culture multicultural uh, world uh, these days. Now let's discuss how to properly record the dates in our records. In general, uh, based on GDP, all entries to a GMP document must have a date on the document, which is basically a tracking system to verify the task was performed on a certain date. Second thing to remember is that all the dates should include three sections, date, I mean the day, month, and year. So you can of course use different formats. I have mentioned here four of the most widely accepted formats for use. Uh, feel free to use them. Um, something to note is uh, it's, it's best practice to use three uh, characters for month just for the sake of uh, clarity. Again, you need to always be consistent in terms of uh, date uh, formatting in all documents you, you handle and uh, consistently use and follow the company style and finally be sensitive to cultural differences in capturing time. Errors in documentation is an important topic. So in general, all documents should be error-free based on GDP, but we all know that it happens all the time. So we need to know what to do if there are errors. Uh, these errors can be in the form of misspelling something, illegible entries, or misrepresentation of the data. In any case, we need to know what to do, and this is going to be addressed in the next slide. For an approved printed document, if you have an error, um, written changes are not allowed at all. So you cannot simply cross the error with the line and write the right thing and initial and date and be done with it. In these cases, you need to basically consult with your supervisor and the QA manager first and come up with a proper course of action. And of course, in any case, this course of action should have already been mentioned in your SOPs and uh, you need to just follow that and uh, based on the approved quality system flowchart that should be already present, just uh, correct the error. However, if the document you're dealing with is an approved document that is manually recorded, it's much easier to handle errors. You just remember we are not supposed to scratch or overwrite the data, and also we should not use a liquid correction fluid or masking tape. So well, uh, all we need to do is to cross a single line through the text to be corrected, such that the text is, is a still readable, then write the correct information beside it, mention the reason for the error, enter the date of the correction, and initial. And that's it, you're done with it. Okay, now let's talk about rounding, rounding rules. 
when you are calculating, uh, most of the time try to leave at least two to four digits for accuracy, depending on your company requirements. Make sure you carry these digits, these extra digits, throughout all calculation steps until the very end. And then you can round them off. So in order to round them off, basically uh, increase the preceding digit by one if the removed digit is equal or larger than five. And um, keep the preceding digit the same if the removed digit is less than five. So for example, if you have 22.857, you can round it off to 22.86. And if you have 20.873, you can round it off to 20.87. Now, what about backdating? So first of all, let me define what is backdating. The act of going back to a previously completed document without proper documentation of initial and date, and then adding the dates and initial at a later date but placing the date of completion as the date the task was originally performed, which is a date in the past, is called backdating. And uh, based on GDP regulations, it's not allowed under any circumstances. It's a wrong thing to do. But we all know that um, it's very common situation that somebody is, you know, filling documents and is being rushed and uh, forgot, forgets to date or... Um, uh, put a time, you know, in the document. So we need to know how to handle it, and I'm going to mention this in the next slide. So you need to basically um, mark the blank space with an asterisk, and uh, uh, you can, of course, use any other sign as well as uh, as long as um, it is unique throughout the document. And uh, in a second, I will explain why uh, it's important to have just one sign per page. Then you need to record the same mark somewhere else on the same page where there is some space available and provide the notation that the data was missing and mention the reason that the information was missing clearly mentioned the number of changes that the notation applies to, especially if you have more than one, it's very important to make sure you mention this for the sake of clarity. Then provide the date of action, which is the time of recording of the missing data, and uh, not the original time, apparently, and uh, initial and uh, comment. So, um, the use of notation is limited to only one per page. Um, and even it is preferred that if sufficient white space is available on that same page, just generally avoid using any of these in, uh, as, as asterisks or notations. Now let me explain why the use of notation is limited to only one per page. The risk with using asterisks or any other mark is that additional changes may be made by another person who uses the same mark or for notation. And that notation could be interpreted to be applicable to all those changes with that specific mark by another person. So therefore, it's best to clarify clearly and uh, put the number of the changes uh, that the notation applies to. You can write, for example, two entries changed above due to entry of wrong data and then initial end date. Another thing that uh, will help you a lot in dealing with documents is to know how and when to void or cancel the records. In case of discovering uncorrectable errors in a process after the process is completed, for example, discovering an error in making an in-process material after the completion of the procedure, um, you need to basically know what to do. Um, in most of these cases, you need to discuss this scenario with your supervisor or often QA manager and seek their advice to see what you need to, be, you need to do. You may need to discard the material that was generated from uh, the process and start from scratch. 
So basically what you need to do is to void the documents that were generated from the past process. And you can do this by simply writing the word void across the front page of the document or by stamping void on the first page of the document. Then you need to um, repeat the process from scratch without errors and hopefully this time it's going to be error free and create new documents and then attach these um, void document to the newly created documents uh, for the correct process. Initial date and ask your supervisor or QA manager to initial and date and you're done. Um, another thing that you need to know about um, is how and when you can recreate or rewrite records. Uh, based on GDP regulations, recreating or rewriting of records is not allowed in a regulated environment. Unless one of these four uh, conditions that I have mentioned here apply. Uh, if the original record is not legible or has a poor quality, if the form or the document used to capture these data was not the right form in the first place, if the record is damaged the way it's not repairable, and finally, if the original document was captured on a media that will not last the burden of time. For example, if you have been using um, thermal paper strips uh, to capture the data, you know that it's not going to take um, uh, long for this uh, to be faded. So you need to basically do something to preserve the data and, and make it in a for, uh, permanent form. So uh, only if you meet these any of these four situations, then you are allowed to uh, basically recreate or rewrite the record. And in order to do that, you need to get the approval of your supervisor or the QA manager first. Recreate the document in a manner that none of these four conditions apply any further. Then identify the newly generated document as a rewrite or transcript. Again, you can simply write these words on the first page of the document or um, use the stamps. And finally, you need to um, uh, reference the rewrite document to the source of information and attach the original as well as the back of the uh, new documents. Uh, you need to also be careful that uh, any of these following um, three cases, if uh, is present, it is, this, it is considered to be a setup for transcripts, so it's not a load. Use of post-it notes to capture data for any kind of calculations during the process. Um, use of a scrap paper to document the information or calculations or a recording any part of the data on unofficial records. So you should avoid using any of these situations. Uh, now let's discuss deviations, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with since it's often happening in the work environment. So in spite of all the qualified equipments and trade employees and all the validated process and everything that we do, the daily routine of manufacturing is prone to situations where um, the approved workflow will fail to deliver what is expected. So for this reason, it's very important not only to define the workflows for production in normal cases, uh, but also to specify what is considered um, or defined as deviation. So we know what happens um, or what we need to do if this happens. Uh, so um, this will basically ensure that uh, the maintenance of the acceptable product quality is in place, even if the um, uh, deviation or something uh, that goes wrong is in the middle and you need to take care of it. There are different names for deviation. Um, discrepancy, atypical situation, or non-conformity. These are uh, non-conformity. These are all the same. Um, as I mentioned before, there is no uh, clear definition by any of the regulatory bodies for this um, deviation. But in general, uh, the, in terms of definition, we can say it is the failure to meet the specifications. 
in the in-process specifications or production process and requirements. Um, as I mentioned before, um, each company should have a clear written definition for devi deviation for its own situation, which will be greatly helpful in avoiding confusion at the time it happens. Also, when deviations are being handled normally, there are interfaces uh, that are introduced with corrective and preventive action system, which is known as CAPA, and the quality risk management system. It is also good to know that deviations are taken into account in the management reviews, which are supposed to happen at least once a year, as indications for um, uh, the stability of the process and the workflows that are in place. There are certain areas that are prone to deviations, and I'm going to mention them here and the in the next few slides. Uh, regulations is one of those areas that are prone to um, deviations. Very often you see that there are deviations that happen in following steps that are uh, mentioned in standard operating procedures or SOPs, either missing a step or not following it properly or in the right uh, order or direction. Then um, another area of deviation that is commonly observed is with machinery and equipment or in plants and facilities. Uh, deviations in uh, these areas can be in many different forms. It can be equipment defect or failure, or it can be in the form of outside of limit calibration results, for example, in a temperature, humidity, or pressure difference, or even number of particles. Um, it can also happen in the microbiological count monitoring, which does not fit the certain criteria that is defined in the SOPs for that product. And finally, deviation can happen if a lack of regular calibration or maintenance interval happens in your area. Product process is another area that is prone to deviations. Deviations can happen in manufacturing formulation, in process material specifications. It can also happen in a testing process for in-process controls, for example, using of an absolute lot, which is considered um, a deviation. Um, it can also happen in process abnormalities, process parameters and specifications, pest control sector abnormalities, and good re uh, receipt procedure abnormalities are all uh, examples of uh, deviations in this area. Furthermore, quality control is another area that is prone to deviation. For example, results that are out of specification or out of trend or results that are very close to the specification limits, as well as uh, usage or uh, of uh, expired reference standards, for example. And finally, storage also is an area that is often um, prone to deviation. Uh, for example, exceeding the defined temperature or humidity limits in the area that you store your products. Um, uh, or abnormalities in the pest control sector or even abnormalities in the area of receiving procedure. Therefore, it is important to be familiar with the SOPs that are related to your uh, work area to be able to differentiate and recognize if this is a deviation or not. And if it is a deviation, you need to know proper course of action. So um, what needs to be done? Let's explain in the next slide. First of all, when you if, um, uh, spot a deviation, you need to um, capture uh, the deviation in a very thorough and detailed manner. Then you need to investigate for the potential causes that um, was the reason for deviation. Next step is to do a risk assessment for the current as well as the in-production batches that might be affected by this. Then you need to uh, identify and propose a suitable course of action in order to handle the affected batches. You also need to specify and propose corrective and preventive action in order to prevent the potential recurrence of the same uh, deviation in the future. You need to be able to show a risk assessment calculation for your proposed corrective and preventive action to support them that they will work as effective as you are hoping to be. 
then you should propose um, I uh, define the controls and test measures uh, in order to show the effectiveness and suitability of your proposed corrective and preventive actions um, to show how you can check their uh, efficiency. Implementation of proposed corrective and preventive actions is the next step. Then you should test the effectiveness of these um, proposed actions and be able to show that the results support them. And finally, you should apply a periodic review of the system effectiveness to make sure the entire uh, proposed action in place is actually working effectively in prevention of deviation. So with this, um, let's just start to discuss some general GDP principles in relation to lab notebook documentation specifically. First, let's start by assignment of the lab notebook. Each company should technically have a lab notebook policy, a record retention policy, and a documented record showing that all the personnel involved in handling lab notebooks um, or products have been trained properly for these uh, lab notebook training. Also, you need to assign a unique identifier number for each lab notebook when you check them out. Uh, meaning when you assign them to each individual. Uh, you need to write down the name of the company, the name of the individual it is assigned to, and the date of the assignment. Uh, it is good practice to fill out the table of content in the beginning of the lab notebook to ease the tracking of all the experiments when the notebook is completed. So here is the schematic representation of a hardcover lab notebook and the first page, as I mentioned, and the first page is uh, involved in certain information that you need to fill. Um, when you open the lab notebook, the first page is assignment page. You have to write down the company name, the department name, the notebook number, which is a unique identifier for this notebook. Normally, the company should have a logbook with um, all the assigned num notebook uh, uh, numbers listed in here and uh, with the name of the person it was assigned to and the date of assignment. Also, you need to mention the name of the person the notebook is being assigned in this first, first page as well as the date of assignment. Table of content is the next page after the first page, so it's good practice again to Fill this out. It's considered um, uh, best practice to uh, fill this as accurate, uh, accurately as you can. Uh, number the experiment, provide the titles, and the start page here. It simply helped uh, another individual in the future to be able to find different information from this lab notebook very easily and um, uh, properly based on this table of content that you're filling out. Now let's focus on some general tips and how to properly write in your lab notebook. First of all, always remember to use only a permanent ballpoint black pen. And why black? Because blue pen, as I mentioned before, does not reflect well when you do photocopying. And also do not use pen, pencils or uh, color markers because they are going to fade over time. In case of any mistakes, do not use whiteouts or correction tapes. As I have mentioned before, what you need to do is to um, uh, use the single uh, line through the error and um, enter the correct information beside it. Write the reason for correction, initial and date. This single line should be such that the information sh still can be read you know, through the line. So you, you should not conceal or cover the original information. Um, here, just a you know representation of uh, not using permanent or color markers because, as you see, if there is a drop of liquid, it can be faded and uh, spread out. Also, here is just reinforcement of not using correction tape or whiteouts to um, correct your errors. Uh, 
When you start to write in your lab notebook, start with the title of the experiment first and then provide the objective of the experiment, list all the materials, reagents, and equipment needed. Explain the methodology in sufficient details. Write the results of the experiment and uh, remember to always be factual and also provide a conclusion and try to avoid uh, opinions or negative comments. Just uh, mention what you're seeing as a result or conclusion. Also provide enough details to enable another person in the future to reproduce the same results based on what you wrote. So try to mention the quantity of the material used, any operational details and conditions that may help like pH or temperature, yield, product name, lot numbers, standards that are used, reference numbers, reference materials, suppliers, details, information, and expiry dates. In this example, you can see the type of details that have been provided in the lab notebook. Uh, volume, temperature, time of heating, volume per well, per well uh, volume of buffer and its pH, volume of the ladder that was used and the size of the ladder, the volume of loading dye as well as the voltage and the length of time to run the gel, and volume and name of the buffers for staining solutions. Now, um, how to separate experiments. Uh, start each day's work on a new page. If it is a new experiment, it's preferred to even use the right side of the notebook. If it's the continuation of the previous experiment, but it's another day of work, you can continue on the left-hand side as well. And um, just start the page with um, the phrase continued from page such and such, just for the sake of clarity for someone else to be able to follow what was done. Enter the date on every single page and make sure you sign and um, date every single page and you need to also have somebody verifying every single page. Okay, and when the experiment is for the day is complete, uh, draw a horizontal line right after the last line date and sign. This is to close the area so nobody else can add anything to it. Also, if you see that there is any blank space left on the page, you need to draw a diagonal line to close that space so again nobody else can write anything. Here is um, another um, example of um, uh, how to close the end of the day for your experiment. So basically, as soon as you close, you just cover it with the line, horizontal line, and sign and date. And you see here that there is still much uh, space left uh, at the bottom of the page. You don't leave it like that. You have to draw a line, make sure it's closed so nobody else can write something in it in the future. And uh, the other thing as a good practice habit is to start on a new page for each day of the experiment as it's shown here. So day two, uh, you put the date, you put the title of the experiment, you say continued from page such and such and start writing for day two too. This is just to reinforce that it's not a good idea to start another day of the same experiment on the same page. It's just basically to make it easier for a future reviewer of the lab notebook to figure out what is going on. Now, how to include tables or graphs. Sometimes you may need to include graphs or tables in your lab notebook. So it's important to do it properly to be compliant with GDP um, rules and regulation. So first thing to know is uh, you need to have a title for each table and each graph. Number these um, tables on a consequent basis for each experiment. Make sure the table or graph is labeled properly. If there are symbols and signs, you need to make sure somebody else reviewing the table could completely understand what's going on. And lastly, there is a need to um, 
make sure the tables are cleared and you're not covering anything underneath when you attach them to the paper. Here is an example of um, how to consider a title and uh, numbering the tables and figures. Sometimes you may need to attach something um, to your notebook. For example, you have done an experiment and you have print out some results uh, from other instruments. You have some charts, some graphs, and you need to uh, print and uh, attach it to your notebook. So you need to know how to do it. So first thing is to use the um, permanent adhesives for this purpose and uh, attach the printout such, it, such that it doesn't cover or obscure any um, part of the data that you have already entered in that page. If the attachment is bigger than the size of the page, you can fold it, but there is one condition, and that is when unfolded, the attachment should be still within the confines of the open notebook. If that's the case, you're fine. This is mainly to protect the notebook from the wear and tear during the time and anything that is within the hardcover will be protected. So that's why you need to make sure this is uh, properly done. Then you need to date the attachment and sign such that the signature covers part of the attachment as well as the paper and uh, ask your supervisor or QA manager to check, verify and sign and date for you. Here is uh, just to show that um, you can sign the attachment such that the signature covers part of the attachment, as you see, along with part of the paper. And then underneath, you can see that there are explanation of the numbers and what is uh, basically loaded in each um, column. So, you know, another person in the future can understand your picture, your, your graph. Um, how to store metadata. Oftentimes, uh, in this time and age, you are involved in experiments that generates a big chunk of data in the form of databases that cannot even, you know, be printed or be kept in the notebook. So we are going to discuss how to properly deal with this kind of situation to be compliant with um, GDP rules and regulations. So the first thing is to check them for accuracy. Then you need to paginate them. Uh, sign and date each part of the data series and place them in a binder and name the binder and make sure it has a unique identification number. Then in your lab notebook, mention um, the binder unique ID, uh, date of data capture, page number you're referring to and the name of the person who captured the data in the binder. And this, uh, this is a proper way of handling metadata. Uh, sometimes it happens that you may need to refer to another previously completed lab notebook. Let's say, for example, to say that you are using the same protocol without the need to repeat the entire protocol in your lab notebook. So what, what you need to do in this case is to include the unique identifier number for the lab notebook you are referring to and the lab notebook page you are referring to plus the researcher's initial and you are covered. Finally, the last part of the general principles, um, and that is how to properly store the completed lab notebooks. You need to always remember that lab notebooks are confidential and they are considered to be the property of the company. So they should not be kept in the researcher's work area after they are completed. This is mainly to protect the data that are captured in the notebook in case of unforeseen events like spills or fires that are not uncommon in the labs. Eventually, they should be returned to the company archives for proper storage when they are filed. Um, so um, now let's discuss the conditions for storage of these lab notebooks in order to be GDP compliant. The storage should be done in a separate room in a safe area that is fire resistant and preferably in a metal cabinet that can be locked. And only certain authorized individuals, including QA manager, should have access to it. If you want to make a copy or uh, review a previously completed lab notebook, 
first thing is to know that this is um, uh, not allowed without the permission of the authorized person. So the first thing you, you do is to get the permission from the authorized person to basically get access to this um, previously filled lab notebook, check them out, and this should be reflected in the logbook with the name and initial of the person who is checking them out with the date and time of check checking out. Then you can do your copying or your review as you need it. And then you have to check this back in after a certain period of time. Again, you need to make sure this is reflected in the logbook with the time, date, name, and initial and signature of the person. So now I'm going to focus on GDP that is discussed in the newly released above 1000 general chapter 1029 from US Pharmacopeia under the name of Good Documentation Guidelines. So a history of the USP chapter 1029. Um, an expert panel was uh, established to address good documentation. This panel was formed on December 2012. It had expert panel members from FDA as well as uh, big and small pharmaceutical companies from the globe. They proposed to have one uh, chapter above 1000 for good documentation guidelines. Uh, the fact for these above 1000 chapters that they are not uh, enforced or binding uh, is just for the sake of information. This chapter was um, basically uh, numbered as 1029 and uh, it was published in Pharmacopoeia Forum or PF40 Series 3 in May 2014 with a three month uh, comment period. Um, a series of comments were received from both individuals, companies, as well as FDA. It had to go to a uh, comment period again in 2015 and then there was a ballot that was done in February of 2015 and the chapter was officially published on uh, December 1st of 2016. Uh, what was the purpose of this USB chapter? Uh, basically, uh, the purpose was to create a new chapter that was for information and not binding uh, to uh, help basically gather information for the GMP regulated industry in one place to assist the users in the design and preparation of procedures to promote the integrity and quality control that was required. And the chapter basically discusses good documentation guidelines at a very high level for different type of records that I have mentioned here. So these records include lab records, equipment related documentation, investigations and deviations, batch records, uh, certificate of analysis, standard operating procedure, protocols and reports, analytical procedures, and finally training documentation. The entire chapter is not more than six or seven pages. And uh, in this slide, I have listed the outline of this chapter. Um, they have the purpose se section and then scope. Then they have principles of good documentation, data collection and recording, then they, they discuss different type of GMP documents, which I mentioned in my last slide, and they're also listed here. And finally, they discuss uh, retention of documents um, in this chapter. Uh, at this point, um, I would like to elaborate a little bit also on GDP and the European Union view of it. There is a document by the name of Rules uh, uh, Governing Medicinal Products for Human and Veterinary Use in EU and um, in Volume 4 of this document, which is titled Documentation, GDP is discussed. In the European Union, instead of uh, having CFRs or Code of Federal Regulations that we have here in the US for FDA, they use directives instead. So there is a directive uh, 2003 ec volume four, which discusses the guidance on GMP for medicinal products for human use. Under this directive in chapter four, there is a discussion on documentation best practices. 
This document was further revised on uh, June of 2011 in two main areas. Bulk of the revision was in generation and control of documentation, as well as retention of documents. And this revision was basically done to incorporate some more aspects of documentation and its best practices in GMP environment as it relates to increased use of electronic documents um, as a new movement in the industry. Um, what was revised in this revision? So um, it was the uh, first time that was mentioned um, the fact that you have to follow your procedures. Also first time mentioning the need for having an SOP or standard operating system. Um, furthermore, it was the first time that they had uh, mentioned an imperative mandatory style need for documentation and also mentioning about site master file or SMF. Uh, they mentioned basically um, what needs to be included in SMF, the requirements of keeping it up to date, and also the steps that you need to follow on how to submit the SMF as a part of the approval process. Also, there was an increased uh, coverage on the use of computer system, just to address the increased usage of electronic system in the industry. There was also an increased clarity of record maintenance associated with the manufacture of clinical trial material, uh, basically mentioning that um, the records should be kept at least five years after the completion of formal discontinuation of the last clinical trial where the batch was used. Furthermore, they provided an inventory of documents that should be maintained within quality management system. There were also an increased clarity in this new version on the length of the record keeping for manufactured drugs. In the new update, the two sentences related to this issue that were separately mentioned in different parts of the document were basically brought together. So now uh, it reads um, as um, the records should be kept for one year after the expiry of the batch or at least five years after certification of the batch by the qualified person, whichever is longer. There was also an increased requirement level for policies, procedures, and records in this new revision document regarding technology transfer, change control, product quality review, supplier audits, internal audits, and investigations into deviations and non-conformances. The GDP rules and regulations in the EU are basically the same, um, very similar as the ones um, we have already discussed for FDA and ICH. Um, so I'm not going to go in depth or um, it would be redundant. I have just listed here the outline of these sections uh, they cover in the EU in relation to GDP in this new re revised document. So the first section is principle, then they cover required GMP documentation, uh, followed by generation and control of documentation. Uh, then there is good documentation practice as another section, uh, followed by retention of documents. Then specifications are discussed, plus manufacturing formula and processing instructions, as well as um, procedures and reports. Now that we have discussed the rules and regulations of GDP, and we know what needs to be done, let's discuss the enforcement of GDP and how it is applied by different regulatory bodies around the world. Here I have listed some of the regulatory bodies um, around the globe that are in charge of enforcing the GMP regulations and audits. In the US, we have Food and Drug uh, Administration, FDA, in Canada, there is Health Canada, and in the European Union, each member state um, uh, is in charge of enforcing. I have also mentioned other countries in this slide and the next slide for your information, but I'm not going to go through all of them one by one. This is also the second slide, continuing to mention these uh, countries 
uh, along with the um, responsible regulatory body. Then in this slide, I have listed some of the popular GDP-related observations that were reported by FDA following the audit of different companies. One of the very popular observations um, was not assigning a delegate for QA manager in case of his or her absence, which you need to easily address in an SOP, but it's important. The next popular case was that QA-related SOPs were not signed and authorized by the QA manager of the facility. Then the next one was lack of documentation for sample sequence tables. Uh, that was um, uh, another popular observation that was reported by FDA. And finally, another area of, of observation was in the case of out of specs uh, events, uh, where they observed that often there was no flowchart or checklist or a detailed procedure of how to handle the situation. One of the popular area of observation was in the area of correction of errors in the document. So often that the correction was carried out without proper reasoning, signature or initial or date. And often they cited white overs, um, multiple line throughs and the use of whiteouts or masking tapes. Now let's review some of the most popular GDP related non-compliances that are considered to be fraud by regulatory agencies. Back entering the data without proper traceability, meaning that data entry um, without initials or, or dating. Also creating the um, or altering or deleting information for the purpose of meeting the acceptable criteria is another um, uh, uh, case of fraud. Signing on behalf of another person under anybody else's name is a wrong thing to do. And finally, hiding or discarding um, undesired data. You cannot select from your data. You have to capture everything and show everything to regulatory bodies in terms of audits. These are all occasions that, believe it or not, are still happening in the US and outside and if caught by the regulatory agencies are considered to be fraud and there will be penalties involved. In the following slides, I have gathered uh, different occasions of 483s or warning letters that were issued to different companies for failing to follow GDP in their documentation and record keeping. Um, these four occasions of warning letters issued to companies in India, China, and U.S. for citing documentations that were not contemporaneous. In other words, uh, the documentation were filled out and signed not at the time of the action. As I mentioned before, one of the principles of the GDP is that each step of function needs to be documented before you can proceed to the next step. So you can uh, copy each of these um, cases into Google and read about the entire story and it would be good reading here just to enforce some of the teachings or uh, items that we discussed today in this uh, webinar. Um, if your records are not accurately uh, reflecting what was done, that is a problem. As you see here, there were um, there was a US FDA warning letter that was issued to Seoul Pharmaceuticals Limited in India in 2000 for this reason. Also, as I previously mentioned, the use of detail marks are not allowed in GDP. And you see that there are people in the industry that do not know that. Uh, there was a US FDA warning letter that was issued to all Medicare Home Aid uh, Incorporated in 1999 for using detail marks. We also discussed before in this webinar that you need to have a signature in every single regulated document. And we highlighted that it needs to be a handwritten or electronically captured signature. And that the use of signature stamps are not allowed in GDP um, environment. These two FDA warning letters were issued to US companies in 1997 and 2006 for using signature stamps that were not technically allowed. 
Um, as obvious it is after our discussion today not to use pencil or any uh, in any regulated documentation, there are some people in the industry who are not uh, aware of this simple fact. So you can see here two examples of FDA warning letters to two companies in India and Singapore in 2000 and 2010 for using pencil in their regulated documentation and records. Also, as I mentioned in today's session, we need to sign or initial all handwritten changes in the documents, and we also need to add the date of the change. Here is an example of an FDA warning letter that was uh, issued to companies in the US as well as Ireland in 2008 for not following this simple GDP rule. We also discussed in this session uh, that obscuring uh, of the data or a part of data in any form and shape is against GDP regulations. You see two examples of FDA warning here uh, issued to two companies in India and Belgium in 2000 and 2007 for not following this simple rule. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you some excerpts of observations that were issued by FDA to different companies in the year 2013 for violating different GDP um, rules and regulations. In 2013, there were 56 cases of, uh, of observations by FDA where the batch production and control records were not prepared for each batch of product, or it was present, but it did not um, include complete information related to production and control of each batch. So in order to be compliant, you need to have batch production document completely filled, signed and verified by the QA manager and store them properly for every single batch of your product. Also, there were 34 cases of FDA observations due to SOPs either lacking or not being followed for evaluations that were supported, that were supposed to be uh, conducted at least annually to review the records associated with the uh, representative number of batches, uh, whether approved or rejected. So um, for being compliant, you need to have SOPs in place uh, explaining the details of annual evaluations of records for a representative number of manufactured batches and these should include both approved and rejected batches. You cannot um, just focus on the approved batch. There were 32 cases of written records of investigations related to unexplained discrepancies or failure of a batch or any of its components to meet their defined specifications, but without consistent inclusion of a conclusion of a proper follow-up. So basically, in order to be compliant, you need to have SOPs that um, explain uh, in uh, proper detail the steps to be taken in the occasion of any discrepancies, deviations, or batch failure, along with uh, the responsible individuals um, that need to be defined in these SOPs. You also must keep the records that show in any of these occasions the event has been properly investigated um, on time and you need to be also um, able to include the conclusion, corrective action taken and preventive follow-ups that you have taken. Uh, 28 cases of observations also where the drug product production and control records were not either reviewed or approved by the quality control unit to determine compliance with all established approved written procedures before a batch was released. So in order to be compliant, you always need to have SOPs that explain uh, the process of drug production and controlling the production records. These SOPs should also list the parties that are responsible for each step, including verification and approval. And you also need to keep the records showing that these SOPs are being followed and all the manufactured products have been properly reviewed and approved by responsible parties, including QA manager, before the batch was released. 
there have been 28 cases of observations by FDA where there were either a lack um, of or not following the procedure described uh, in the handling of all written and oral complaints regarding a product. So in order to be compliant, you must have written SOPs that explain exactly the full process of receiving, filing, and handling of all complaints in any shape and form. And you must have records in place showing that you have been following these SOPs all along. There have been also 26 cases of, of observations where the lab records did not include complete data derived from all the tests, examination, and assays necessary to assure compliance with established specifications and standards. So uh, to be compliant, you must have SOPs that explain the pr process of capturing data in the lab you need to capture the complete data from all tests carried out. You cannot select which one to capture. You have to capture them all and record them all. These records should be able to demonstrate that proper tests and examinations and assays necessary have been performed and showed compliance with the defined standards and specifications um, in your SOPs. Also, 26 cases of observations where the written procedures for cleaning and maintenance failed to include uh, specific information that I have listed here. So, um, in order to be compliant, you need to have SOPs that explain in detail this process of cleaning and maintenance, and uh, you need to include all kinds of details. For example, responsibility assignments, schedules, methods of disassembling, cleaning, maintenance, and reassembling the in, in, uh, instruments and equipment, materials that you use, instructions for removal on um, removal of previous batch identification, and instruction for protection of a clean equipment from contamination uh, prior to use. These are all need uh, to be um, mentioned in your SOPs in, in detail. Also, 25 cases of non-compliance where there were either no written procedures or there were lacking sufficient detail to describe the receipt, identification, storage, handling, sampling, testing, approval, rejection of components, drugs, product, containers, and closures. So in order to be compliant, you should have always SOPs that explain in sufficient details the process of receiving identification, storage, handling, sampling, testing, approval, and rejection of all three um, uh, uh, categories. It can be components, can be containers, or can be closures. And you need to have records showing that you're following these uh, SOPs. 23 cases of non-compliance where written procedures were not established or followed for evaluations that were done at least annually and including provisions for a review of uh, compli complaint recalls, returned or salvaged drug products, investigations conducted for each drug product. So in order to be compliant, basically you need to have SOPs that explain in full detail uh, the process of annual evaluation of any complaints that you have received, any recalls or any returned or salvaged product. And you need to show, uh, you have records um, that, you know, showing that the SOPs are being followed. Uh, 22 cases of non-compliance where the written records were not always made of investigations into unexplained discrepancies or the failure of a batch or any of its components to meet specifications. So in other words, you need to have SOPs that explain the pr process of investigations for any of these situations, for example, unexplained discrepancies or any deviations or failure to um, meet the specifications of the batches.
And as usual, you need to have records in place to show that you have been following these SOPs. 18 cases of FDA observations also uh, where the written records of major equipment, uh, equipment for cleaning, maintenance, and use were not included in individual equipment logs. So you need to have SOPs that explain in full detail the process of major equipments, how to clean them, how to maintain them, and how to use them. And you need to have records in place showing that you have been following these SOPs on an appropriate um, interval and you have been able to file this with the log of these instruments. 17 cases of um, uh, citation in terms of non-compliance where the lab records did not include the initials or signature of a second person showing that the original records have been reviewed for accuracy, completeness, and compliance with the established standards. So you need to have SOPs that explain this process of capturing the data in the uh, lab and this uh, uh, includes the need for a second individual verifying the work being captured in terms of accuracy, completeness, and compliance with the established standards and specifications uh, based on your SOPs. And as usual, you need to have records in place showing that you have been following these SOPs all along. Uh, also 14 occasions of non-compliance in 2013, uh, as shown here, where the procedures describing the warehousing of drug products were not established or followed. So you need to have SOPs for um, warehousing of your products in great detail, and uh, you need to have records showing that you have been following them. Two cases of FDA observation where the procedures were not established to assure that the responsible officials of the firm um, were um, notified in writing in any cases of investigation that were conducted, recalls, reports of inspe uh, inspectional observations that were issued by FDA, and any regulatory actions brought by FDA in uh, relation with uh, good manufacturing practices. So basically, in, uh, in a nutshell, you must have SOPs that explain the process of informing the responsible officials of the company. In any of these cases, for example, investigations that are being conducted, any recalls that are going on, reports of inspectional observations that are issued by regulatory bodies, or any uh, regulatory uh, actions that are enforced by FDA regarding the GMP rules and regulations. As usual, you need to have records in place showing that you have been following these SOPs. Also, two cases of FDA observations where there were no written production um, and process control procedures in order to ensure or document that all the key process uh, parameters were controlled and to ensure that any deviations from the procedure were justified. So again, you need to have SOPs that explain the production and process control procedures to ensure that all the key process parameters are controlled and within the defined specifications based on your SOP for this product. And any deviations in this area are being uh, detected on time and corrected and justified properly. And uh, again, you need to have reports showing that you are following your SOPs. Two cases of observations where there was no record of checking the production area or all equipment in the production area for cleanliness and suitability immediately before use. So you need to always have SOPs as well to explain the process of checking the cleanliness of both the production area and all the equipment in that area uh, that are being used in production. And you need to have records showing that you're following your SOPs. And one case of non-compliance where the records or copies of records were not made available for photocopying or other means of reproduction for the review of the agency. You need to understand that regulatory documents um, need to be in uh, um, archive in such a way that they are readily 
available to be inspected or being copied if um, regulatory agencies are asking for it. And finally, one case of non-compliance where the records of the return product were not maintained properly. So you need to have SOPs that explain how to handle the return product in proper detail with the responsible parties involved. And you need to show that these SOPs are being followed. In summary, GDP rules and regulations are very simple and easy to follow. All the personnel, including um, uh, full-time um, permanent summer students, consultants, advisors, who are in um, contact with the product in one way or another need to know these rules and regulations and follow them properly. It can keep you away from lots of different troubles. Um, and remember to keep records that show you are following your SOPs since as FDA treats it, if it is not written, it's not done. Uh, the next is six slides that I have mentioned here are just references that I have used to prepare this presentation. Feel free to go and um, look at them. It has lots of uh, good information and um, I'm not going to mention any of these here. You can just feel free to browse them, uh, put them in Google search and uh, find the documents and review them. This concludes our webinar today. I hope it has been helpful for you and uh, thank you for attendance. Please feel free to contact us at info at easyglobaltraining.com for any questions you might have regarding this webinar or any other courses that we have on our website. Also visit us at www.easyglobaltraining.com. Uh, you can view a list of all upcoming webinars and courses that we have. You can subscribe to our monthly newsletters, promotional rates, and coupons that we offer for different courses and materials that we have on our website. You also can pre-register for our upcoming courses and webinars to save your space. We have uh, people from all over the globe, industry experts of different background, and uh, we often have them uh, produce on-demand or uh, live webinars. So you're more than welcome to go to our website and browse and see what we can offer. Uh, you can also become an approved uh, consultant or instructor with us, so please feel free to submit your interest plus your CV so we can review and get back to you. Finally, you can request a consulting service for regulatory and quality compliance as well as medical affairs. We also have different social media channels, so feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We post interviews, talks about different areas of regulatory and quality and snaps of our webinars, upcoming webinars, in this channel. Also, you can follow us uh, at Facebook or Twitter to stay up to date on what we have to offer. Again, thanks for being with us for this webinar and hope to have you soon again.